Hi everyone and welcome to this week's War's End History Story. This week I am covering some of the history of the Ship Inn in Wellington Quay, also previously known as the Verne Hotel. It is not a complete history but does include some information about things that went on there in the past and some of the past innkeepers. I hope you will enjoy it and find it interesting. The Ship Inn was said to be built in around 1822 However, I was unable to find any mention of it in any of the old newspapers until 1846, when, like many pubs of the past, as I have said before in other stories, it was being used as a venue for an inquest into the death of a man who had fallen off the platform at Wall's End Railway Station, caused by a dark night and poor fencing, and also because the man appears to have got off the train in the dark and mistaken War's End for Howden, and stepped down where he would have done at Howden, only to find nothing but fresh air below him. The innkeeper at that time was a Mr John Ridley. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to find any details about John, but by 1851 the ship inn had been taken over by Martin Clark. Martin was born in South Shields in around 1822 and was married to Dorothy. The couple had one known child, a boy by the name of James Clark. Martin was a long-serving innkeeper running the ship in until his death in September of 1875. It would be at this point that his wife Dorothy took over running the pub and Dorothy continued to run the ship in until around 1877 when James, her son, took over. For anyone just looking at the names of who ran the pub, it would then look like James' mother, James's mother took over running the pub again in 1889. However, this is not the case, as James had married a lady who was also called Dorothy, who had once worked for the family in the pub. Though it is hard to say for sure what her job had been at the time, as it states, servant, but this could have just been a barmaid. Anyway, it was this Dorothy who took over running the ship in in 1889, and it seems that she would continue to do so until her death in 1896. It does not appear that Dorothy and James had any children, as I wasn't able to find any details of them. It was quite common, even if you did not actually own the public house that you lived and worked in, for wives to take over the running of the business after the death of their husbands and children to take over after the death of their parents. And due to this happening, the Clark family were innkeepers of the ship inn for over 45 years. Staying with the time when the Clark family were running the pub, similar to many others, auctions were often held in the public houses for the sale of properties in the area, and in 1866 one such sale was taking place, which was for 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 and 13 Hodgson Street. It was said that they were in very good condition and that the rental value was around £102 per year, which today would be almost £15,000. Sadly, there are no details of how much the property sold for in the end. A somewhat strange tale appeared in the papers in 1862 concerning the parrot owned by Martin Clark. It was said that it was a type of African grey with a red tail and had caused a much excitement in the area as it had laid three eggs. The newspaper who printed the story encouraged people to go and visit the bird and the eggs at the ship inn at any time, though I can't imagine they would have been too happy if someone had turned up in the middle of the night. Of course, like all pubs, it also had its fair share of drunk and disorderly cases, such as one for John Mullen in 1872, who was fined 10 shillings for refusing to leave the pub when he was asked to do so. Though it has to be said that I did not find anywhere near as many stories like this for the ship in, so perhaps the Clark family had more success at throwing people out than other innkeepers had in the past. There were many other innkeepers in the ship after the Clarks had left, but I won't mention them all, however... 
it is probably worth mentioning George Watson, who was the license holder in 1908. He was applying for the renewal of the license after there had been convictions against the pub for illegal gaming and gambling on the premises. At the time of the hearing, Mr Watson said that he believed things had now been put right. There had been no gaming and no domino playing and the bookmakers were not allowed on the premises anymore. He also claimed that the previous issue had only arisen when he had been away and not in charge, so he felt that now he was back, things should be fine. The magistrate said that they would grant the licence as long as there would be no more gambling, no betting and no domino playing. I have to admit I did feel a bit sorry for those going to the pub who could no, no longer play dominoes, but of course those playing at the time were not just playing for fun and they no doubt found somewhere else to do their illegal gambling. I did not find any details anywhere suggesting that the ship inn had been rebuilt in the past. It is possible that the pub had been quite well built in the first place and already large enough to not need any changes in later years. But if it truly was built in 1822, then it seems unlikely that it wouldn't have needed at least some small changes in the early 1900s, such as the addition of inside toilets, which pubs didn't have previously. And I know that people may laugh at this, but I always check out the bricks on old buildings, and the brickwork of the pub is suggesting an 1800s build. The smaller the bricks are, the older the building tends to be, and also a line, which I hope you can see in the photo on screen now, of bricks running in what seems to be the opposite direction to the others, also often suggests an 1800s build. So maybe it truly is the original building, or it was rebuilt at a time just before the building styles changed. The pub would continue to train for many years to come, but when the whole area was changed as part of the process of building the Tyne Tunnel, and the streets that led to and the surrounding streets around the pub were all gone, it must have felt like a little isolated pub in the middle of nowhere. Of course it wasn't really, as there were still many houses close by, and the nearby workmen would have no doubt called in for a pint or two but it was no longer in the middle of a built-up area like it had once been. One of the last known licensees in the ship inn was Thomas Robb in 1966, but of course there have been many more since he was in charge. As with a lot of pubs and clubs, in more recent years there is a lot less information to be found out about them. They are simply, in most cases, just a business that is running as it should be with people going in and out for nights out, etc. In the late 1980s, I believe around 1986, the pub changed its name to the Vern Hotel. I don't actually know why this name was chosen, so if anyone listening knows, do please let me know. Since then, it has had many owners and has also had many times when it's been closed for quite long periods. I do remember just a few years ago taking a lot of photos of the pub when it was closed as I wasn't sure if it would ever open again. But I believe it is currently open and trading under the name of J&J and &J Bar and Cafe. However, I haven't been able to actually confirm this as every time I have been down there that way it has been closed. So again, if anyone can confirm if it is still open, then do please let me know. So even though the end of this video hasn't had as much information as some of the others in its, uh, for the pub in its later years, and it has been quite a short video, I do hope that you have still enjoyed it and enjoyed hearing a little bit about the earlier life of the ship in. And I thank you all very much for watching and I do hope to see you all again very soon.